Hello folks, I'm Katrina, I'm a Baroque violinist and I'm going to chat to you today about some points I've been thinking about about Francesco Geminiani's Opus 1 violin sonatas in a comparison between their first edition in 1716 and their later reissue in 1739 and how looking at that work uh, for me suggests evidence for a kind of Franco-Italian style of violin playing that might be relevant for Dublin and Ireland in the 18th century. So I'll ha have a look at the context of Geminiani and his sonatas and uh, some ideas about his place in violin playing in Ireland and in Britain and then a little look at what might um, be the performance practice that we could take from these works. So uh, here he is, Francesco Geminiani, born in Lucca of course and there's a suggestion that he was taught by Corelli or was certainly influenced by Corelli who's obviously the most probably the best known violinist of the 18th century um, and after leaving Italy Geminiani spent a, a good bit of time in London and in Dublin and um, about five years in Paris and then he actually died and was initially buried in Dublin in 1762 and he's an interesting figure to have a look at in terms of the performance practice in the period because of his career really so he wasn't attached to an opera or a theatre making his living as a performer as a lot of violinists were at the time he taught quite a bit he taught a number of the important violinists in the London and Dublin scenes at the time um, Matthew Dubourg who would be master of the state music at Dublin Castle um, Michael Festing Charles Avison and then he spent a bit of time teaching the sort of well-educated amateurs of the nobility as well so when he was in Dublin he set up his studio his Geminiani's great room off Dame Street and he taught and gave concerts uh, and then of course we know him as at the end of his life having served as as music master to Charles Coote of Coote Hill in Cavan um, who was the Earl of Bellamont later on um, but Geminiani's influence in terms of practice I think goes goes beyond his students because he did yes write the book on violin playing in this era so we have his art of playing on the violin um, the English version published in London in 1751 and then he has his earlier texts as well like um, the rules for playing in a true taste on the violin German flute violoncello and harpsichord um, but there is a very notable absence of certain things in the art of playing on the violin which is why for me it's really useful to examine these opus one violin sonatas so this set of sonatas was published first in 1716 um, reprinted it in amsterdam in 1719 and then revisited in 1739 to create another version um which i'll talk about in a minute but the opus one sonatas i think owe quite a lot to corelli um, I mean, Corelli is the influence on violin playing in in Europe in the 18th century, um, particularly Italian influenced Britain and Ireland. Um, and particularly on violin playing, you can see the influence of the Opus 5 sonatas. And I sort of get the impression that Geminiani is a little bit trying to set himself up as a, the Corellian figure in Britain and Ireland um, in the same in, in this period his first set of works being a set of violin sonatas Geminiani's opus one it's a little bit unconventional it's more often you would see an opus one being a set of trio sonatas in this period and then the simi there's certain similarities between Geminiani's opus one and Corelli's opus five they're both uh, sets of 12 which is fairly common um, and then they have the same structure in terms of this first six being sonatas da chiesa, the church sonatas, um, with the freer slow movements and then the more fugal fast movements. And then the second six being the sonatas da camera with the more dance inspired movements. Um, but also we have this duality with the Corelli's opus five are not as famous maybe in their original edition, but in their reissue um, by uh, Roger, the, the Amsterdam printer, um, which is the one that violinists will know particularly well. So these are the ones that were reissued with the ornamentation that Corelli apparently played um, himself. 
and without the ornamentation the sonatas are quite plain as we can see with a lot of scale movement a lot of triads uh, which sort of lends itself to ornamentation and ornamenting um Corelli's opus 5 was uh the thing to do in this period so we do have a lot of extant ornaments from different violinists including to to masters of the state music in Dublin Castle ornamented um created their own ornamentations on on Corelli's opus 5 so we have the ones from we have some of the ones from Matthew Dubourg um and there were apparently also a set of ornamentations by uh William Viner who was an earlier master of the state music but I don't think they're extant so just as as an example in the sort of ornamented unornamented um dichotomy if we play the Corelli unornamented play Corelli's ornamentation in the the Roger version a lot more sweeping and interesting and then if we have a look at the Dubourg version, it's a bit of a different style again, a little bit more. A little bit more French. So a lot of violinists obviously have talked about the Opus 5, but my point is that this dichotomy between the initial version plain and the reissue with the ornaments i can sort of see as having been on gemiani's mind with the reissue of his uh, opus one which he created in 1739 so uh they're quite relevant to us here at east cork early music in that the 1739 sonatas are dedicated to the fourth countess of cork Dorothy Boyle and Nay Savile, who's the wife of Richard Boyle, fourth Earl, and known sometimes as the architect Earl because he's that champion of Palladian architecture uh, in England. And uh, the Boyles are quite famous as patrons of the arts. So they were patrons of a lot of musicians and singers, Gemignani, Castrucci, Barsanti, and architects, uh, artists, writers. Uh, Burlington House, their residence in, in London, hosted Handel during his first three years in London and people like John Gay, William Kent, uh, all the boys. Um, but uh, anyway, the the major item that I think is missing from Gemignani's Art of Playing on the Violin, which would be very handy, is uh, about where to ornament. So he does include this ornament table that you can see here, which is an explanation of the different signs and how to interpret them if they're there but it doesn't really give us any idea of where to ornament outside of the signs and even the concept of putting um, an ornamentation table like this is a little bit more French in style you get the same sort of thing in like uh, Donglebert or Couperin um, meant for pieces that had the ornaments very much prescribed by the composer not not really improvised by the performer so it's quite different from the italian style sort of division-esque um varying on the intervals or the sequences um or this kind of thing and the style of ornaments that we see in the 1739 edition do come across as quite french in the ornamentation so it, you can see here the difference between the 1716 edition here, which is just notes, <coughs> a couple of cadential trills. And then the 1739 edition here has <coughs> all sorts of ornament signs notated and has notes added. And it, interestingly for us, has a lot of the fingerings to use as well. So it's kind of quite obviously intended to be instructive probably would have been the next best thing if you couldn't afford Gemignani as a as a teacher um 
if you were say more in the in the middle classes than than the upper classes you could still have bought the book um but also some of these sonatas are quite difficult technically so there's a possibility that it might have been intended for the sort of professional young professional students um who Jenny Geminiani might have been teaching as again as an instruction manual for professional musicians so not just for your sort of enthusiastic amateurs it might have been a, a good code of practice for um young professionals so if we have a quick look at the differences if we take the un unornamented as printed 1716 version If we add in Geminiani's ornaments, a look at a major sonata the number four we get Geminiani's version or in the 1739 version. So it's not to say that we were ever intended to play these as printed in the 1716 version. That is not very likely. But if you took the plain version from 1716 and ornamented them in a Corellian style, which would be reasonable, you might think, you'd end up with something very, very different uh, from what Geminiani eventually writes in 1739. You know, changing taste and all that, but still the, the style is, is very, very different. Um, and what Geminiani is writing in 1739 does come across as quite French, these delicate um shorter ornaments kind of frills and flourishes rather than the Corellian sort of sweeping um divisions which are more um based on the the harmonic structure almost rather than the melody so you just get this sweep across and you can't even lose um the melody in it and in Corelli's opus 5 of course you do the the melodies are a little bit more um suited to ornamentation like that so Geminiani's m melodic writing is a little bit more angular a little bit less simple uh, which maybe doesn't lend itself to this Corellian ornamentation quite as much it, you're getting a little bit more galant than than baroque um, and you can sort of see a little bit of this galant style coming out in in the ornaments as well um like we have uh, in the art of playing on the violin we get this sign for the turned trill so it's not that you expect to automatically turn um the trill but what's interesting is that Geminiani is often quite insistent on it so he does have this notation um specifically for a turned trill but equally in the 1739 edition he doesn't expect people to turn 
the trills it's not assumed but it's written in quite a lot so he is quite insistent on it um and i can imagine it would have been a bit of a nightmare for the printer to put in every single time all of these tiny little uh notes he's written them out as grace notes um particularly on trills that are decorative rather than cadential he tends to write these um these turns in as grace notes and then occasionally he does have a little bit of, of a decoration where he writes um, the grace notes of the turn with a little bit of a Lombardic rhythm, a bit of a Scotch snap. So so from these indications, um, for me, I think it's it's pretty likely that there are a lot of French influences coming into Geminiani's writing playing and presumably teaching at this time which is why i think it, it is relevant um for the people that he would have been teaching in dublin and ireland so there are a few other indications of french style coming into this work as well um say in when things get higher up uh, in the 1719 edition here you can see that he just writes lots of ledger lines which you might expect but in 1739 he changes clef into this g clef on the bottom line of the stave which you do see much more of in in french music the french soprano clef so from all of these indications i think it's clear that gemignani was bringing a lot more french style from his uh time in paris into his writing and playing and presumably teaching uh, at this time which is why I think it would be quite relevant for us looking at music being played by people he might have taught in Dublin um, and what I've emerged from with this exploration uh, of the two versions of the Opus 1 sonatas is uh, this which is a little bit difficult to talk about but quite useful if you're a violinist um, a sort of reverse engineering of how Geminiani ornaments different intervals um, by comparing the 1716 and 1739. Uh, and just one more point which uh, I think is interesting about French style in the Dublin scene in the 18th century. A uh, good way of knowing what's going on is uh, or how things are changing is if people are complaining about it. So we do have this nice quote from Mrs Delaney's diaries. So she's writing about a violinist um, uh, Giovanni Battista Morella who is Italian but she calls him French and is giving out that he's ornamenting in the French style quite tastelessly to her mind so she says yesterday evening we went to a concert to hear a new French fiddler Morella by name he has a particularly fine execution plays with great ease and prettiness but, but as it was all nonsense music I am not sure I shall like his taste till I hear him play music of consequence. And I believe on the whole, he has too many tricks to please me often. I am afraid his French taste will prevail. I shall not be able to endure his introducing froth and nonsense into that sublime and awful piece of music. What makes me fear this will be the case is that in closing the eighth concerto of Corelli, instead of playing it clear and distinct, he filled it up with frippery and graces, which quite destroyed the effect of the sweet notes and solemn pauses that conclude it. So I'll take a solemn pause there as well, I think, and finish on that note. Uh, huge thanks to the Arts Council and the Irish Early Music Network for making these uh, video explorations possible. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe to our channel um, by clicking up above or you can find our mailing list in uh, the description box below uh, if you'd like to keep up to date to what East Cork Early Music is up to. Thanks a lot for listening.